evening and we'd like to welcome you to worship for Sunday night, August the 7th. Uh, by way of announcements, um, things that you might be interested in giving to, of course, our weekly needs, our offering. Uh, we'll be taking up offering later in the service, but if you're joining us on Facebook Live or on the YouTube recast, you can mail your offerings in to P.O. Box 205 or bring them by 504 Griffin Avenue. Uh, our audiovisual fund, we are looking to upgrade some audiovisual equipment, so if you want to give to that, that goal is there in your bulletins. And Operation Christmas Child, our August shopping is hygiene items and school supplies. There are cards down front if you want to donate, and of course, anytime you want to donate to the food pantry, of course, you can do that. Be, uh, be advised that if you want to donate money instead of uh, items, that is also always welcome. This afternoon, we had our prayer walk at our school, and that we had a really good crowd for that and prayed for the upcoming school year. Sunday night, August the 14th, we'll have a business meeting after our evening service, and then August the 28th, Sunday morning, we'll have a deacon's meeting at 7.30 a.m. At this time, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we ask you to be with us tonight, Lord, as we worship you here. We ask you to open our hearts and open our minds to what your word has to say to us. And Lord, help us to apply it to our lives, Lord, that we may live closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Our call to worship tonight <clears throat> is when the rope is called up yonder.
you for that, Miss Melinda. And uh, we do want to thank those who uh, participated in the prayer walk this afternoon around campus over at the school. And uh, Brother Brian Thrasher from Shiloh put together a guide for us to use that had some verses, specific things to pray for. And we have some of those guides left on the front pew there if you would like to get a copy and you can use that during your prayer time each day to pray for our school, pray for our administrators, students, teachers, all those things and during this upcoming school year. You can grab one of those to use during your prayer time. In Revelation chapter 8, we have moved now to the seventh seal being broken. And when that seal is broken, the trumpets of judgment begin to sound. And that's what we're going to be looking at tonight in Revelation chapter 8. We're going to see some events preceding the trumpet blowing. We're going to notice events accompanying the trumpet blowing as well as we're going to look at four trumpets sounding tonight. Uh, let's start out reading the first verse together. The Bible says, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you now. We do pray once again that you would just honor the reading and preaching of your word here tonight. Dear Lord, we're thankful that your spirit is here in our presence tonight, dear Lord, and that you will speak to our hearts tonight through your word. Lord, I pray that this message will challenge us, that it will encourage us, that your word will strengthen us. And Lord, thank you that you have equipped us and continue to equip us with what we need to live victoriously every day and to work and serve in your kingdom. And Lord, we pray all these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. And we just came off chapter 7. It was the sealing of God's servants. We talked about the great worship services that had already taken place in heaven with the church being raptured and that taking place. The angels were singing. They were praising. They were worshiping as well. And then last week, the saints from the tribulation period are seen in chapter 7. Once they get to heaven, they're going to be praising. They're going to be offering up uh, worship as well. And so we know that heaven is a place of worship. It's a place of service. And so there won't be very much quiet uh, moments in heaven other than what we see here in Revelation chapter 8 verse 1. And it, being that we live in the south and Mississippi we know of the tornadoes that come through from time to time and you, if you've ever been in the middle of the storm you know that there's usually that calm. There's usually a lull. The wind stops blowing. Everything kind of gets quiet and then the storm hits. And that's what we're kind of seeing here in Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. Adrian Rogers says he believes this is probably the longest period of silence ever in heaven recorded in Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. Because he said when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And you can imagine how everyone there is just kind of in awe. Because this is now going to be where the book is completely opened. Every seal has been broken and now the judgment is going to begin to take place on earth. For those who have rejected Christ, for those who have rejected God's message and have rejected God's messengers and have lived how they wanted to live, conducted themselves how they wanted to conduct themselves, are going to now experience wrath from God. Up to this point on earth, what you had been seeing was that God had given people over to what was going on. We read about that in the book of Romans, right? God had given them over. They were getting what they thought they wanted. And now they're going to experience even more judgment from God as he peels back even more mercy. And so there's silence in heaven. As I was reading and studying this, one commentator pointed out, if you ever thought about silence and how people react when there's silence for a long period of time as a pastor, 
Stop preaching for about 10 minutes and see how the congregation reacts. So they didn't know what was going to take place exactly, but they were anticipating what was going to take place. They were wondering what they were going to hear, what was going to be read, and there's silence. There's a pause in heaven at the opening of the seventh seal. You move on to verses 2 through 4 of chapter 8, and we begin to see here what not only John heard, but what he saw. And so he had been hearing all of these praises, these worship uh, services going on. He had been hearing the angels flying around and all of these things he had been hearing and seeing. And now for 30 minutes, there's no angels flying. There's no angels crying out, holy, holy, holy. There's no worship services going on. It is total silence. And then in verse 2, he said, I saw the seven angels. The tradition by the Israelites where there were seven angels that surrounded the throne of God. I, I have no idea whether they were Spanish or not. I just know they were seven angels. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God and to them were given seven trumpets. And so now they know that the trumpets are about to blow. Now, there were various reasons that trumpets were used in the Old Testament period. They would be used to gather the troops together, to call congregation together for worship. But here, what we're going to notice in the book of Revelation, every time a trumpet is mentioned and the trumpet blows, it is bringing judgment. More punishment is going to come. But what you begin to see before the trumpets blow is that the prayers are heard. The prayers are presented. The prayers are answered by God from the saints. It says, another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense. This is the idea of our prayers being offered to God that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, altar which was before the throne. And so this is an encouragement to us as Christians. This is an encouragement to us as believers that our prayers are heard. That all the prayers of the saints are heard. This should be the certainly motivation for us even if we haven't read anything else about prayer in scripture it should be a motivation for us to understand as Christians that our prayers are offered to God he hears those prayers we no longer have to go through a priest we have direct access to the throne room of grace through our faith in Jesus Christ the Bible tells us that we can boldly enter into the throne room of grace and we can offer up our prayers and petitions to him and he hears them. They are presented to him. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, ever interceding for you and me. And so Jesus is praying for us right now. And he'll be praying for us five minutes from now, and ten minutes from now, and fifteen minutes from now. He'll still be praying and interceding for us, pleading on our behalf. And our prayers are heard. And they are heard any time, day or night. We don't have to worry about or be concerned about whether we are uh, bothering God. or And even with our prayers, what we need to understand is no prayer is too small, no prayer is too big. We just need to offer up our prayers to Him. We need to communicate with God. It's important that we offer up our prayers. It's important that we communicate with Him and then not only communicate with Him, but allow Him to communicate with back with us and we can pray the promises of scripture to him that's what we see many times in the book of psalms the psalmist is just simply praying scripture he's reminding god of promises that he has already made to individuals and to the nation of israel and so we pray as we read and study the word of god we can highlight promises and we can underline things that can enhance our prayers The bottom line is, we need to spend time in prayer. 
We need to offer up our prayers. When we're hurting, we can pray. When we're celebrating, we can pray. Whenever we are dealing with crisis situations in our life, we can pray. And what you'll notice here is also in the book of Revelation, remember those tribulation saints as well as some of the saints that uh, are there before the altar that came out of the church age were praying and asking, when are you going to avenge everything that happened to us? When is judgment going to take place? And what we're going to see here in Revelation chapter 8 is that judgment is going to begin to take place. It wasn't necessarily according to the people's timetable. It was all according to God's perfect time. That's what we have to understand about prayer. And the importance of prayer, the significance of prayer, and to continually pray because we are not on, God is not on our timetable. He has everything mapped out and planned out according to his perfect timing and plan. He is sovereign. He is in control. And so we see these prayers are offered up. They are heard and they are answered. It says there in verse 4, the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. So these prayers make it up to God. And now the trumpets are going to begin to sound. And on earth... They are going to see thunderings, they are going to see lightning, they are going to experience earthquakes, and they are going to hear all of this, experience all of this, see all of what is described in these next verses. And verse 5 was simply the preview. It would be like today if you were scrolling through whatever device you may be streaming your, uh, what app you may be streaming your TV through, or if you still have direct TV or Disc Network, if you click on something and it pulls up a preview, well, that verse 5 is the preview of what is about to come. It is a sample of the frightful punishment to come as the angel casts fire from his censer upon the earth. Verses 6 through 13 begin to explain and begin to describe the events accompanying each trumpet blowing. The first trumpet blows in verses 6 and 7. It says, And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. That's interesting when we read that because remember that as we started going through the book of Revelation back in chapter 6 and Following all of that was going on here, even a little bit further back, maybe in chapter 5, some in chapter 4, we began to talk about the significance of the book of Revelation for Christians as it should be our motivation for evangelism. This shows us that we need to be serious about taking the gospel into Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the utmost parts of the earth because we don't want our family, we don't want our loved ones, we don't even want our enemies to experience what these people are going to be experiencing that begins in Revelation chapter 8. It's going to be devastating. It's going to be uh, unpleasant uh, to say the least. And so much like these angels have prepared themselves to sound the trumpet, we must be prepared each day to share the gospel. We must be prepared each day to sound the alarm, to let people know that today is the day of salvation, that there is no uh, other day guaranteed. We're not guaranteed to take another breath on this side of heaven. And so now is the time to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Now is your time to serve Christ with all of your heart, mind, body, soul, and strength. Now is the time to love your neighbor as yourself. Now is the time for us to be prepared and to be ready to share the gospel whenever we are given an opportunity to do so. We can't keep putting it off and say, well, I'll 
I'll pray for that person tomorrow or I'll witness to that person next week or I'll call that person next month or whatever it is that we keep saying now is the time and we must be prepared and we must be preparing others for Jesus' return. These seven angels were prepared and they began to sound the alarm. In verse 7 it says the first angel sounded. And they followed hell and fire mingled with blood and they were cast upon the earth and the third part of trees was burned up and all green grass was burned up. Now, can you imagine what it's going to be like? We already know what happens many times out west in California and New Mexico and all these different places that have experienced wildfires and it seems like every summer there's a wildfire somewhere that burns thousands of acres of land and trees and destroys homes and wreaks havoc and causes devastation, sometimes caused by lightning strikes, sometimes caused by uh, people being careless, sometimes fires set on purpose, whatever the case may be. We see the devastation. We see the destruction. Well, this is amplified here in verse 7. Whenever you begin to look at it being hail and fire mingled with blood, the idea there is it's possible it was a volcanic eruption that takes place in various parts of the world on earth. And all of the fire and the lava and coming out of these volcanoes gets into the atmosphere, which causes hail to begin to fall from the sky and it is mixed with the lava from the volcanoes and it causes much devastation and destruction. And in North America, South America, Africa, all parts of the earth, a third part of the trees are burned up. And that's significant. <laughs> that's significant for the time the, because not only will it rob people of oxygen, but it will take away food sources. It will take away all kinds of things. And all green grass was burnt up. The people on earth at this point have to be wondering what's going on. All the people that have already been raptured out that are missing that nobody's been able to explain to them where they're at or what's going on with them. News media can't explain it. The Antichrist can't explain it. Nobody can really explain it and tell anybody the truth and now all these things begin to happen. You would think it might cause them to stop what they are doing and wonder and ponder and maybe seek out some of those people that we mentioned in Revelation chapter 7 that are now believers in the tribulation period, the 144,000 Jewish believers or the prophets that we'll see later on. But what you will notice as we keep going through these times of trumpet and all these uh, trumpet sounding and all these things happening is rather than the people repenting, rather than the people surrendering to God, rather than them acknowledging Him, they continue to live ungodly lifestyles. In the middle of all this stuff going on. So the first trumpet sounds, one third of the trees and grass are burned by hell and fire mixed with blood. Then you get to verses 8 and 9, the second trumpet sounds. The second angel sounded. And as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. Now this could literally be a mountain that collapses into the ocean or into the seas, but we believe that it was more likely is going to be a meteorite or an asteroid or something uh, cosmic like that that is going to fall to the earth and it's going to hit and it is going to cause chaos and it is going to cause uh, navies to lose their ships and so people won't be able to defend themselves. It's going to destroy marine life, which is, once again is going to affect the food supply. It's where some of the blood is mingled in and, and 
is found in the water and all that stuff that's talked about there. The third part of the seed becomes blood. So now there's water issues, there's issues with having food, there's issues with people's navies and their defense against attack because now marine life has been affected, ships have been destroyed, leaving, uh, leaving much devastation and destruction right after all this that we've already seen. So the earthquake takes place, the volcanoes erupt. Now here is a meteor, a meteorite or an asteroid that falls and it causes all kind of destruction to the third part of the sea. Now, in verse nine it says, a third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. So where are those dead animals going to wash up at? They're gonna start washing up on shore. And so can you imagine the stench that is going to be all around and that's gonna to have to be cleaned up. Something's going to have to be done with all of those marine life that wash up on shore. 10 and 11, the third trumpet sound. The third angel sounded and there fell a great star from heaven burning as it were a lamp and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of the water. And the name of the star is called Wormwood, bitterness. So now what happens is not only is sea life affected and the salt water becomes as blood in many places, but fresh water is going to be affected as well. We know what it's like in many parts of the world now. I mean, if you were to go on a mission trip to uh, places in Mexico or Africa or any of those other places uh, in, in our world, you're told not to drink the water there. These missionaries have to take water with them and water is provided for them. Many times food is provided for them because you don't know what you may be eating in some of those places. You don't want to get sick while you're there. And so we, we have all these safety measures that we put in place when we send missionaries out in different parts of the world or they have some way of purifying the water that is there. What happens here is the star called bitterness or wormwood falls into the water and it becomes bitter. It becomes poisonous. And so now you can't bathe, you can't take uh, water and drink it out of the sink or out of the stream or anywhere because it could poison you. You could die. That's the devastation and destruction that is going to be taking place each time these trumpets blow, which should be a reminder, it should be a wake-up call to those people left on earth that God is real. That he has always been real, that he has always been who he said he was, that he was always going to do what he said he was going to do, that his word is true, that his word is accurate, that it does not return unto him void, and that they have spit in the face of God, rejected grace, trampled over the cross and the mercy available to them through their surrendering their lives to Christ, and now they are facing the consequences. Look at the fourth trumpet. The last thing that we're going to notice tonight in verses 12 and 13. The fourth angel sounded. And the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. So what you begin to see here is now the days and the calendar and all of that kind of stuff is going to be completely uh, thrown out of balance and off course. The days aren't going to be as long as they used to be. The night may be longer. We, I mean, it's just going to cause all kinds of confusion uh, and chaos. The world is being completely affected by sin. 
It, it'll be kind of like it is in Alaska whenever they deal with that time period where there is less daylight and it's dark for longer periods of time and they talk about the psychological effect that it has on people who live in that part of the world because of how dark it is and how long it stays dark and there's very little light for long periods of time and then there's other parts of the year where there's light and very little darkness and so it takes adjustment and there's going to be no time for adjustment here because what we're going to notice as we get into chapter 9 next Sunday night is that the plagues keep coming, the trumpets keep sounding, and so the world is in total chaos. In verse 13, it closes out with John saying, And I beheld and heard an angel, some translations there say an eagle, flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe! Woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. This angel or this eagle is going to pronounce woe upon those left upon the earth. And he's letting them know as bad as things seem, look, and what they've experienced so far is nothing compared to what they are going to face when the next three trumpets blow and then the vile judgments begin to fall after the sounding of the seventh trumpet. The aftermath is going to be devastating. The eagle here is warning the earth in regard to the final three trumpet judgments. It's why we need to be busy evangelizing. It's why the church needs to remember our purpose for being here. And why we haven't been raptured out yet is because God is still working and he is still moving and his Holy Spirit is still drawing people to Christ. So we need to be presenting the gospel. We need to be talking about the seriousness of sin and we need to be living ourselves as if we believe the seriousness of sin and the consequences that it has in our life. May we be ready. May we prepare ourselves to continue to share the gospel, to sound forth the word of God in the middle of crisis situations. May the church be the city set upon a hill that cannot be hidden, the lighthouse that is needed in dark and difficult days. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you now.